Good. So, right. So uh, now we've talked about uh, Transp H comp and glue, which uh, um, we're all kind of hidden under an abstraction layer um, in uh, the Agda cubicle library, uh, which makes it kind of easier to use uh, cubicle type theory for non uh, uh, experts on cubicle, I hope. So, uh, yeah, so it's one of the goals of the library was kind of to uh, try to come up with a good abstraction barrier uh, that makes it possible to work with cubicle type theory without uh, having to read uh, five really technical papers before one gets started. All right, so now I'm going to talk about something where I don't uh, have to... Um, refer the details to very technical papers, uh, which is higher inductive types. And they work very nicely and intuitively in cubicle like that, I would say. Um, so these higher inductive types, you've seen them briefly in, uh, was it Bass's uh, course on Tuesday, I guess? Uh, you saw a bit about uh, how to kind of get them into Coq uh, using private inductives. Uh, which is kind of a neat trick, but uh, here we don't need anything like that because uh, cubicle type theory supports very general class of high inductive types kind of natively or with some work, but we did the theoretical work and now we've implemented it in cubicle like that. So essentially all higher inductive types in the hot book, except for the Cauchy reels, I think uh, you can do a cubicle like that. Maybe you can even do the Cauchy reels now. I don't know, but uh, you can do almost everything, or maybe even everything you can do in the hot book. You can do directly in cubicle like that without any any trouble. Okay, um, so let me. Uh, so I'm gonna show you some set quotients, which is essentially higher inductive types, but where you truncate and get rid of all the high dimensional structure. And these are, are just like quotients that we know from mathematics or computer science. Uh, and, they, and they're kind of nice to work with because you truncated them. So you kind of forget about all the high dimensional structure uh, that types might have. Um, so that's a nice class to work with. Then I'll talk a bit about propositional truncation, which you've seen before. Um, and then uh, I'll end with some synthetic homotopy theory. And in synthetic homotopy theory, that's where you take high inductive types, but you typically don't truncate them. So, and then this higher dimensional structure lets you do all kinds of, uh, yeah, homotopy theory in a cool way in Agda or cubicle Agda. All right, so that was the intro. Let me get started. So. Um, so I'm going to start uh, first example, finite multisets. So what are these? These are just lists where you quotient by a permutation. So swapping two elements, uh, yeah, two, two lists uh, are equal if you can kind of permute the element and get the other one, right? And so let me just write this down. So uh, FM set, uh, finite multiset. <coughs> of uh, A's, it's just a data type um, where we have the empty list, or the empty set, uh, or multi-set. We also have a cons operator, just like for lists. Okay, so now I've defined lists. Now I want to add some higher constructors, which lets us identify those lists where you permute elements. Right. So for that, I have a constructor call, it takes X and Y in A, um, an FM set, then X cons Y cons XS is identified with Y cons X cons XS. This is, I have to tell Agda, that this is an infix operator with a certain level. Uh, okay. And it's right associated. Now Agda is happy. Now it can parse this and uh, 
Yeah, so now I've essentially taken lists and quotiented them by uh, permutation. Now, for this uh, to not have like any higher structure, I also need to set truncate it because I want it to be a set. So I just want to say that for any two finite multi sets and any two proofs that these are equal, the proofs themselves are equal. All right, and now we have defined our first higher inductive type. Um, and you see it looks just like a normal definition of lists uh, in Agda, but you have two extra constructors, one giving us a, a path and one giving us a square, really. So this is a square in a, uh, Fn set of A, because we're identifying two uh, lines or two paths, right? So we can just write this down, no problem. Let me now define a function. Uh, maybe plus plus for uh, concatenating two of these. Oh, sorry, I should type it like this. So how do you write such a thing? Um, so in hot, uh, you would first postulate that you have this type and then postulate that you have an induction principle uh, or eliminator and so on, and then define everything in terms of that. In cubicle like that, um, high inductive types are more or less just like normal, like normal like the data types. You can just pattern match on them and we'll see what happens uh, to the higher constructors when I tell Agda to pattern match for us. Oh, whoop, now things turn yellow and Agda gets mad, but uh, don't worry about that. Um, okay, so what happened? So we have a case for the empty list. Okay, that's expected. And then we have a case for cons. Okay. Then we have cases for com and trunk. Um, let me just rename things. Uh, Nexus one, Nexus two, I don't know. Um, okay. So we get cases for all of them. And you see um, in these two cases, we have this I and the J and I and J here, if you ask Agda. So I uh, is an interval variable. So, um, so the reason this works is that um, the path equality in uh, cubicle type theory is just, just a function. So this is like, um, yeah, this is just a like this constructor com takes an x, a y, an xs, and then an interval variable. And it gives us something in fm set of a, which uh, at i0 is this, and at i1 is this. And this thing is the same. We have an xs, we have a ys, and we have p and q, and then uh, we get a square. So Agda automatically figures out that this is a line of lines or path of paths, so it's a square. So it takes two uh, dimensional variables, i and j. Um, and uh, when you instantiate for i zero, you get one thing, i one, you get another and so on. Uh, yeah. Okay, so it's kind of nice, uh, I think. And it really shows the, the, the kind of the strength of the, uh, well, yet another strength of this uh, view on uh, equality as paths and having them as natively be just paths because like writing down a general schema for this kind of cubicle hits is uh, not at all as hard as doing it for uh, um, hot hits. Um, so, so uh, yeah. So that's why we can kind of support this kind of general schema and just write any kind of any old hit we want as a data type. Right, so let me finish this definition. So, well, this case is easy. This case is also easy. It's just what we think we would do. And then now this things start getting interesting because now we need to deal with the um, com constructor. And here we see, so we need to construct an FM set of A that we know, that's the conclusion of the thing. Uh, but we depend on some I and we it has to satisfy a certain 
boundary condition or two boundary conditions. When I is zero, it's this. And when I is one, it's that. And well, there's a kind of an easy way to satisfy this, which is just writing. So this um, is a path from x cons y cons x is plus plus y is to y cons x cons x is plus plus y is right. And this is exactly what we want. And if we just apply this to i, we get the reference set of a, which has the right boundary. So it's not very hard writing the cases for um, the path constructor call. Now for the square constructor trunk, it gets a bit more involved because suddenly we have a i and j and then we get four conditions because we're constructing a square. Um, and now I'm just gonna, oh yeah, I'm just not, I'm just gonna rename things just not to confuse myself when I try to type it up because uh, yeah, if I just do this without, uh, um, yeah, well, so we're going to construct a square where we have a way to fill any any old square um, in this trunk. So now, uh, well, yeah. I'm just starting to fill things up, but uh, like, this is what we need to have. Trust me, if you sit down and think and draw the square and so on, you see this is what you want, then we need two proofs P1 and P, uh, Q1, which are essentially gonna to correspond to these, these two conditions and they need to relate these two things. And for that we use uh, uh, some path magic. But as a question, uh, you were starting off with a left-hand argument that has trunk X's and Z's. And now you're defining it in terms of trunk X's plus Y's. That looks like it's getting bigger. How is this semantically justified? Mm, right, so what is getting smaller? That's a good question. Ugh. Why does Agda accept this? Well, trunk is not the function you're defining. Plus plus is the oh, arguments right. to plus plus uh, are smaller. Thanks, Evan. Yeah, this is a classic can Evan help me moment <laughs> after uh, three hours of or whatever many hours of zooming. My brain is getting fried here. But yes, so it's really um, oh right the plus plus operator is what we're defining. But it looked kind of confusing when you don't have parentheses around. So but yeah, so we're defining this whole thing and this then reduces to a trunk so uh, it has kind of shrunk this thing just moved inside all of the arguments as you can see so like here it jumped in there it jumped in and here here it jumps in but this uh, argument is kind of a bit more complicated because it's a p um, i guess uh, one could rewrite this with a kong yeah uh, I'll leave this as an exercise for the reader, but this is really a Kong with a Super Bowl. Like on P, you're Konging plus plus Ys. Uh, all right. But yeah, good. Thanks uh, for the question and thanks, Evan, for uh, saving me. Uh, okay, good. So now we've defined this operation. Uh, Agda is happy with it. Um, I think we're all happy with it. Uh, let me now uh, prove something about it. So. Uh, Unit left plus plus. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is trivial, I guess. Uh, okay, this wasn't very interesting, but let me do it very quickly just so you can see that I uh, can prove things about it. Well, I could. Not too exciting, but let's do the other direction, which is harder. This is not proved by reference uh -huh. because, well, I mean, this one obviously is refl because we gave the case for for it. So, but here we haven't given a case. So here we actually need to use um, induction or 
eliminate or whatever you want to call it uh, excess and in Agda, the way to do that is by pattern matching. So in Agda, yeah, yeah, you do everything by pattern matching. So whoop, and I'm gonna call this better things. This so the automatic name in in Agda is not perfect, but uh, neither is it in in most systems, I guess. Okay, so the base case. It's trivial. Okay, that's good. This case um, is uh, well, pretty trivial as well, right? It's uh, you Kong x colon colon on on uh, the induction hypothesis. So do this in different ways. Maybe like this. Okay, you could also write it. Uh, like this, which is maybe a bit cooler because you kind of inline the use of Kong and, and uh, it's very cubical. But if people prefer Kong, they're perfectly, it's perfectly fine to use Kong. But very often, like in the beginning, when one starts using it, one uses Kong and Phonics, like. The defined terms, but then one quickly realizes that it's just easier to just abstract over i, j, k, and apply them in whatever order one wants uh, instead of repeated use of funix or whatever. But anyway, okay. So what is this? Oh yeah, yeah. Now this looks scary, or uh, maybe not. Well, it looks like we just need to. Um, Use com on the induction hypothesis. Yay. So uh, with a little Kong, but I'm going to do it in line because now we're used to that. Um, and it has to be like this, I think. Yes. Okay. Well, it's probably maybe going a bit fast if you haven't seen any of this before. But uh, yeah, you see, I could accept it and. Uh, uh, yeah, and I'm just gonna. Well, I'm just gonna cheat now and copy paste this case because it's kind of long to type, and I don't think it's gonna be super informative to see. But or to do, and this should be uh, okay. I had a bit of a headache with the name. Sorry. All right, good. All right. So now you see, you can prove things kind of directly by pattern matching on these inductive types. And uh, you get somewhat used to uh, thinking. I mean, here, this this thing is very, like, if you try to fill this without being, uh, like, used to cubes, thinking cubicle, it's probably going to be hard because this you're really working with a cube here because you have three, three dimensions. So it's really three, uh, yeah three dimensions that you're working with. But in the end, once you get kind of the hang of it, it's not super hard to write these things. Um, but uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, it gets uh, tedious to prove the call and trunk cases when eliminating into an uh, equality. So like, or, when, uh, sorry, when proving an equality of this. Uh, so like, because we've truncated the type. So here we're comparing two FM sets and we know they're sets. So we know that any two proofs of equality in this, this type are equal. So turns out whenever we're proving a proposition, so this is a proposition. So whenever we're proving a proposition, we can kind of fill the com and the trunk case. Uh, using kind of abstract nonsense fillers. Um, let's just put it like that. So uh, what we do in the library is prove useful uh, eliminators slash recursors uh, when eliminating into propositions. Okay, so as like, a, like if, if you wanna sit down and uh, just 
define your own set truncated hit and start proving things. Um, uh, it's pretty good to know that uh, it's worth looking at how we do things in the library because we figured out that it gets really annoying having to always prove these cases. It's much easier to just have a general lemma that deals with these two cases all the time, and then you just give these two cases when you work with them. Um, I guess that's pretty natural, but when you start doing things naively, uh, it might uh, you might yeah do the same work over and over. So uh, yeah. So look at the library if you want to work uh, your own set the uh, truncated case. That's a little advice. Um, right. Okay, good. So that was, uh, I guess, pretty cool. So we can define high inductive types, whichever type we want, like this, and we can uh, define functions by pattern matching, and we can prove things by pattern matching, and the proof gets really short and slick. Mm. Yep. Um, all right, so let me just... Yeah, so I'm gonna skip a few things that I say. So you can define like a general set truncation high inductive type. So given an arbitrary relation, you coach it by this relation and you set truncate. So this you can do uh, just like in normal mathematics. It's pretty easy to define. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna show you um, Propositional truncation instead, because it's quite fun and I have a pretty good exercise about it, which isn't too hard. Um, okay, so so propositional truncation is this uh, higher inductive type. Um, takes an A and produces type. Okay, and it has two constructors. Uh, point constructor, as we call them, which is like take an element of A and uh, produce something in the truncation of A. And uh, truncation constructor, which is says that for any two x and y in the truncation, uh, x is equal to y. Okay, so um, yeah, so this we can just write. And this might seem like a kind of a silly high inductive type, I think, well, because, well, why do you want to take a type and just say that all its elements are, are equal? Um, but it turns out it's actually very, very useful um, because we can define things like, uh, let me copy paste it. I'm just gonna copy paste a few things and then I don't have to type everything and I might get through a bit more of what I had to say. So, whoops, sorry, jumping around. Uh, so, so the point is this kind of propositional truncation um, is more interesting than it might first look. So first of all, it lets you define existence. So I think you've seen this already. So if you truncate the sigma, you get like an existence operator, um, like, or uh, existence quantifier is the proper word. And it's weaker than a sigma, and it lets us define things like subjective functions, like specifying when a function is subjective. So it's like when there merely exists uh, uh, something, yeah. And you can define the image of a map and so on. And this you can't really define in 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 pre-hot um, uh, type theory. In kind of a reasonable way because for many many things, having a sigma is too strong. Um, so. It's nice to have this weaker notion. And in the hot book, it's called mere existence, as you've probably all heard by now. And I just want to say we can just define this. And this is used all over the library. And yeah, the recursor is defined by pattern matching. And the eliminator we get from the recursor this is and a little transport. But it's probably not surprising to anyone. Um, OK, so let me. Uh, Two remarks. Uh, so, uh, right. so important remark is that so this uh, so this is really a proof relevant form of, of truncation. So we're not like so even though we're identifying all the inhabitants of the type, we're not like throwing away all information from the type. 
And this might be a bit confusing at first, but this is a kind of a funny thing with propositions in HOT is that they really prove relevant. They're not proof irrelevant in the sense that uh, not all elements of a proposition are definitionally equal, but they're only equal up to a path. And we know a path can contain a lot of information. Yeah. So uh, it's really important that this is proof relevant. So, so even though we have like a truncated sigma, um, we can often extract things from it. Um, so that's nice. Uh, and I wanted to show a little fun example of this. Let's see if it works. Can I get it? Yes. Which I think is fun, but I don't want to type it because now it's getting kind of late later. So we came up with this kind of fun example where you can actually use uh, a truncated thing to compute something useful. Um, I mean, there are other examples of this, uh, I guess. Nikolai Krauss had a famous example many years ago about this, but uh, this one I like. So you can define, like given a type, you can define like a cost monad uh, where you attach a truncated number. And now the question is, have we really added, an, added any information? So um, yes, we have. So you can define, prove that it's a monad, blah, 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 blah like a Haskell monad. Um, and then you can use this to define things. Let's see. Let's take something more fun. Uh, Fibonacci numbers. Ha. Huh. So, like, so what happens here is with every recursive call, we we do the computation that the recursive call does, but we also increase the cost one step. So we're essentially counting how many recursive calls do we do, and we know that like the standard double recursive version of Fibonacci is very bad. So we're gonna get a lot of recursive calls while the tail recursive version is, is linear time because you only do one recursive call. Um, and this you can then observe by actually running uh, the computation. So if you run Fib20, you get some Fibonacci value of, well, Fibonacci of 20, then you get a lot of, like then the truncated number, uh, you can extract the number. I mean, this just computes to a, truncation of a numeral because we have canonicity. So you can actually get how many recursive calls to this do. And if you use the tape recursive version, uh, you get a lot fewer. So, I mean, this might seem kind of trivial, but uh, I think it's, it's illustrating that these truncations really carry interesting content or can carry content. So it's not like you're forgetting all the, 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 the content or of the type when you truncate it. Um, so that was the point. And I think this is something that many people have been confused about. Um, but um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to say with this. Um, yeah. So that was an important point, I guess. Uh, and then enough about that, I don't know. Um, oh, yes, so now. Phew, uh, let me do a little bit of synthetic homotopy theory. Right. Well, here comes my notes. Okay, so that was kind of quick set truncated hits, then a little bit of propositional truncation and why it's, it's actually much more useful than you might first think. And then now synthetic homotopy theory, which is I guess one of the big selling points of HOT is that you can encode topological spaces as higher inductive types and then use univalence to prove properties about them. Um, and a large chunk of the HOT book is devoted to this and tomorrow you will see um, a lot more of this uh, when uh, Engbers does his thing. So let me do a little bit of... Uh, uh, synthetic homotopy theory quickly and just show um, how fun it is in uh, cubicle lambda because things actually compute. So how do you define the circle? We have a base point and you have a non-trivial identification of the base point with itself and it's called a loop. So essentially you have a point and then you have a loop which gives a path from the base point to itself. This looks like a kind of 
funny version of the unit type where you start with a point and then you identify the point with itself and that's essentially just what it is but it turns out this has uh, some nice homotopical structure so let me just show you that we can uh, define a vibration on the circle which i call the helix which is essentially gonna like track how many times we've gone around the circle is this uh, what you call it like is it called the covering space of the circle this winding picture that homotopy theory is drawn draw, whatever anyway we're going to define a vibration and its fibers uh, are going to be the integers well okay so over base put the integers and then over loop we got to put something so some kind of path from int to int and well, we could put refl here, but that would be very boring. Instead, we're going to put this, uh, what do we call it? Suck path, successor path. Yes. So it's a path um, that is constructed using univalence. Um, uh, yeah. So you take like the successor function and the predecessor function are mutually inverse, obviously. And then you turn this into a path using univalence. OK. And that's what you map the loop to. This gives you like a vibration over the circle with, yeah. And okay, then we can actually use this to define a function from the loop space of the circle, which I'm just gonna write base equals base uh, to int. And well, I'm just gonna type it for you. So since you substitute zero along, uh, well, you transport zero along this path over the helix, so to say, which is essentially gonna count how many times you wind around the circle. And uh, I don't know, let's do something fun, a winding of a loop, composed with loop. Why, that's two. Okay, and maybe loop. Composed with sim loop, composed with loop. I don't know. Oh no. Ah, okay. Well, I haven't imported everything I need, and then uh, it, I don't have all the specification about uh, how things, how to parse things, but that makes like the upset. But here, if I compose loop with itself and then the, the inverse of loop. And then compute how many times have I gone around the circles? So I go once around, then another time around, and then once backwards, I get one. And so, on. so it's kind of fun. And this uh, is the kind of uh, one part of uh, proving that, uh, um, yeah, the loop space of the circle is the integers. So we essentially prove that this map is an equivalence. Uh, but uh, uh, da, 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 yeah, yeah. So omega s one was equal to the integers. Uh, proof tomorrow, I think. Uh, yeah, using encode decode method. Okay. So, uh, but uh, one of the exercises has. One, di one part of the proof, but then the other part you need the encode decode method and it's a bit longer, so I didn't put it in. But uh, anyway, you can look at the library if you're interested to see how it looks cubically. Valérie did it yesterday too. Oh, okay. No. Sorry. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, it's a nice little thing. Oh, yes. Um, What time is it? Okay, yeah, I'll do one more example and then uh, I'll wrap up. So, let me just do it like this because I'm getting very tired. I'm just gonna copy paste a bunch of code. Oh, shit, sorry. Spoiler alert. Okay, so I think 
Valerie also showed yesterday how you define the torus as a high inductive type, uh, but I figured I'll show it because it's kind of fun. So, so the torus, you have a point, then two lines, and you identify the lines. Um, well, essentially identify line two with itself over an identification of line one with line one. And that's really where you want to use a path P. So you can use path P as uh, path constructors as well. So you can directly give this path overs uh, as path constructors in the schema for hits uh, that we have. That lets you define this in a very kind of slick way, All right? So, um, and this, this square constructor then corresponds to um, the interior of this square, um, which is really like what you get if you you've imagine that this is a sheet of paper and you fold this at line two and line, yeah, the two line twos are attached and line ones are attached and then you get like a, like a donut. So this uh, uh, higher inductive type representation of this um, thing. Um, and then, well, I think Valerie showed yesterday that you can prove uh, that this is equivalent to two circles. And this turns out to be pretty much trivial because you can pattern match. Um, and uh, so you just write all the cases. Um, I'm not gonna explain this now, but you can hopefully imagine that it's what you want. So like the two base points of S1 times S1 is, uh, well, you add it, like you map it, you map the point there, and then in the other direction, you map it back. So essentially it sets things up so that this is, these two maps are obviously inverse to each other. And then the fact that they cancel is just a matter of pattern matching and putting raffle many times. And I think uh, Arendt had slightly nicer ways of, of writing this using tactics, like you do induction and then all cases are solved by raffle, but in Agda you have to write uh, all the cases, which is a bit annoying maybe. But anyway, the proof is fine. It's, uh, yeah, fits on one screen and it's very trivial. Um, so that's nice. And then univalence gives you the fact that these two types are equal, okay. Um, and I had a little example that we can directly compute by the numbers of the, the torus. So if you have like uh, something in the loop space of the torus, then get a pair of numbers by computing the winding numbers, by converting these to, to circles, and then you compute the winding numbers of those individually. And here I had some example where I uh, like, go around the torus and then go backwards around the interior or however you want to interpret line one and line two uh, pictorially, but it gives you what you want. So this is one minus one, okay? Because we've kind of gone around once and then uh, backwards around in the other direction. So it's quite fun and uh, nice that this proof is, is trivial, I think. And the reason it's trivial is because uh, like these definitions, they're just like normal, normal like the functions. They compute the way you want, like definitionally for all cases. So also for, also for higher constructors like this one. Um, and then hot, uh, the eliminators for hits um, don't compute definitionally for uh, higher constructors. So then you would manually have to kind of apply computation rules to have things, yeah. Uh, like guide, guide the proof assistant in how things compute. But here we really discharge all of that work to Agda. And uh, this makes a lot of things a lot easier when working with hits because a lot of time, like when you're when you start working with in like in hot uh, and you start working with higher dimensional hits, you get a lot of headache because things don't compute definitionally. But here, uh, Things do compute definition. I mean, you still get headaches sometimes because it's it is hard to reason about higher inductive types, especially when they're not truncated. I mean, you you have to do a lot of work, but at least like the work that should be done by computation is done by computation. So I think that's uh, nice, and we've explored this and done uh, a lot of things. Um, so what was I want to say? Yeah, so we've done a lot more complicated hits. Okay, I guess I can just like. Oh. So 
So like we have this folder called hits in the library and it has a lot of hits. Um, so I don't know, I mean, higher truncations, code limits, cylinders, I don't know. The Klein bottle as a higher inductive type and it's fundamental group and so on and so forth and RPN and yeah. So a lot of stuff, oh no, oh God, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of stuff has been done using this, uh, using hits and we've been formalizing quite a bit of uh, synthetic homotopy theory in cubicle like that. And I'm just gonna jump back to the talk, yes. Uh, and in the end, I think I have some references for that. God, I prepared so much. Yeah, so yeah, so we proved a bunch of like theorems like Freud and the suspension theorem and constructed my Victoria sequence for uh, integer cohomology and so on. So there we have two papers about this that you can consult if you're curious um, and want to see how synthetic homotopy theory looks like in cubicle agda. And I think that was the end.